Hi, everyone, and welcome. This is Poets in Conversation. I'm Phyllis Klein, and tonight we have with us Patrick Reardon and Viola Lee, two inspirational poets from Chicago. Patrick T. Reardon is a retired veteran journalist, writes about Catholicism with a twist. He's a prolific poet and will read from three of his very recent books tonight. He's been called a modern day Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and he takes us on a ride through Randolph Street, Clark Street, Proverb Street, Lamentations Road, and Ecclesiastes Road, deeply rooted in faith and in Chicago. His poems bring us, and this is a quote from the back of one of his books, into a world profoundly cluttered, everlastingly unjust, and beautifully incongruent. That's why Archangel Michael can show up at McDonald's next to the Harley Davidson showroom. St. Peter's Basilica can shoot 10 foot tall tongues of flame in loud tourist t-shirts and uh, brown nun habits, halter tops, sun hats, and diapers. See what I mean? And wait till you hear angels are out tonight. Viola Lee is a young breath of fresh air on the Chicago poetry scene. Her parents are immigrants from Korea by way of Canada. Her second book is, a manus is in a manuscript and waiting for whatever publisher is lucky enough to pick it up. Her first book is already sold out. She works in a Montessori school as a Montessori school teacher and has two young kids. As does Pat, she throws in the kitchen sink into her poems with vivid details of what goes, for instance, what goes into her shopping cart at Target. And I'll just give you a little hint on that preview. Gluten-free bagels, raspberries, blackberries, three boxes of mac and cheese, a bathing suit that doesn't make it, um, and lots of stuff in all uh, in the middle all the death and loss that can't be made up in a shopping cart, surrounded by different kinds of sodas and candy at the end. Viola comes to us drunk on wine and prose poetry. <laughs> Such a gift. Tonight, we're going to hear about family and faith in the present with a lot of looking back into the past. So happy to have these two poets and you here with us. So I'm going to read, I'm going to start with a poem of mine, and um, this is a poem that uh, has been sitting in a file, um, waiting, waiting for the right time to read it, and I just thought this might be it. Um, uh, it just felt like it fit in with, um, with these two, two poets' work. Um, so in California, there's a law and maybe in other states too, you can let us know. Where, when you turn 70, you have to take the written driver's test um, and they do not make it easy. It's like a, a very dumb, in my opinion anyway, it doesn't help you with your driving at all, but you have to memorize all these silly facts. Um, and I was extremely nervous. So this is called a 70 year old's mandatory written driving test. The cubicle is noisy and inside heart blasts construct a barricade between you and the disaster of failure. Just let me keep driving for a while. First wrong answer, said blood alcohol level of a person over, not under 21. The computer points it out with a red X and a green check for the right answer. Your inner voice says, such a dumb mistake. Read the question, take your time, you idiot. Luckily, no one can hear. Drink some water. 18 little questions between you and your freedom. That second wrong answer, just put it out of your mind forever. Why does my picture look like a grandmother? Why do they take it before I know if I passed? Bring your mind back to the test, I warned myself, and breathe. 
Here comes the question I recognize from the many hours of studying with two answers so nuanced in meaning, indistinguishable as two fallen leaves on a trail. Please, no more red X's. Skip the question. Computer asks, are you sure? No, not sure of anything, except there were a few correct answers, so keep on breathing. Everything in slow motion now. A few more correct ones. Last question. Your car is disabled, but you can't pull it off the highway. Do you call for help and stay in the car or wait for a safe moment, exit the car, and move away from the flow of traffic? How come you miss this as a practice question? Which way to point that clicker? When the screen says you passed, it seems unimaginable. What about the truck making the wide turn, the one you skipped? Even the DMV giving you a break as you watch from the side of the road, your car flashes on, but you away on a safer journey on the street of still out there, still conquering. So um, now we're gonna do something a little bit different. Um, I thought because these two are such buddies and um, and poetry buddies and friends that I invited them to introduce each other. So, um, so Pat, I'm going to ask you to unmute and introduce Viola. I'm really uh, I'm really excited to uh, to join uh, in this reading with Viola. And uh, so here's here's her uh, her her background. Um, Viola Lee graduated from NYU with an MFA in poetry. Her book, Lightning After the Echo, was published by another new calligraphy. She has published poems in literary journal, journals throughout the U.S. and has recently published in Barrow Street, Bellevue Literary Review, and another Chicago magazine. Her poems recently won finalists in the Pleiades Proof for Pro Poetry Prize and the 2022 Mississippi Review Poetry Prize. Her manuscript, The Only Home, was a finalist in the 2023 Switchback Books Gatewood Prize, semi-finalist in the 2023 Peruga Press Poetry Prize, and recently was a finalist in the XJ Kennedy Poetry Prize. She lives in Chicago with her husband, son, and daughter. She teaches fourth, fifth, and sixth grades at a Montessori school in the city. Take it away, Viola. Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read some poems tonight. And just so you know, um, everything that Pat just read, none of it matters. I mean, it, of course it matters. But um, um, this is just to say that I, um, you know, like... Um, the it, it's actually in the work that's like the most important and so all of the prizes I think the most important um you know like when you boil it down to its essential oil the most important is that the work that it continues to provide so um okay so I'm just going to read some poems um the first poem that I'm going to read um is called Life with Children. And um, it was published in a, a literary journal, journal called Crazy Horse, um, but it's uh, now the literary journal is called Swamp Pink. Um, and so I'll, I'll just read it. Okay, Life with Children. Every night while my children are sleeping, my husband watches crime videos of wives being murdered by husbands and husbands being murdered by wives. It's the only time of day where I'm not the feeling the marital bliss wife and not the grateful to be both mother and teacher, but I wish to God and the heavens that I was the bachelor that I never could become. I feel drunk, especially since I broke the rule of only buying wine for $15 or less. This bad baby cost me $34.99. I feel drunk on wine and prose poetry. How could I forget you prose poetry? The poems that woo me into existence, sorry, into the sheer existence of sheer pleasure and bliss and that feeling that I could do whatever I want in a poem. 
Every night when their beautiful bodies are asleep and they look to me like dead glass dragonflies, I stopped poking them many months ago because they're always alive. I go outside to watch all the lightning bugs my children have collected, breathing on and off, on and off in those old pasta sauce jars, lid poked holes with tack, knowing I could never be a child again, not even when I'm standing at heaven's gate, some church song playing by harp in the background, and an old man with a white beard asking me to give myself a grade. I will say to the old man, give me a B plus, a B plus, letter B for the word bachelor, like the bachelor I could never become, not even in my afterlife, when I'm sitting on my front porch, nursing a cold glass of white wine, prose poems in hand, excited to be left alone, at least until tomorrow morning, where we all wake up to our dried bathing suits, hanging on the clothesline on the lawn, cluttered with Pokemon cards, Barbies, Legos, and paper plates of cold chicken dinner, waiting for each other to apologize. Um, my dear friend who's in my workshop, uh, my writing group, uh, Rod Rodrigo Rojas, um, actually said after reading that poem when we were looking at it uh, during workshop, and he said that the poem is actually not about children, but more about the life of marriage after children. And I think that's right. Um, so that was the poem, Life with Children. I should just keep going. So I'm going to keep reading. Um, the next poem that I'm going to read is called um, The Shooting. And this poem was actually recently a finalist in the Pleiades Proofer Poetry Prize. Um, and it was actually written after um, a news article about um, a young boy who was um, who was killed. Um, and I wrote it actually after I also after a um, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the words, but a um, active shooters drill at school. Um, and so but this poem is mainly about maybe more it's about kindness instead of violence, and it's called The Shooting. I tell my son and daughter, in this life, the point is not to die, to run from the dark alleyways, duck behind the cars, dodge every flashing blue light, channel your ancestors, channel a god. I tell my son and daughter, in this life, the point is not to die, in school, at home, in play, I tell my son and daughter, in this city, you must become the city, become the dark alleyway. And if some little boy, or anyone for that matter, comes running to you, panting and screaming bloody murder in the alleyway you have become, say clearly and kindly, how do I help you? This is my only ask. This is your only home. Do you hear me? Look at me. Do you hear me? Repeat what I just said. Okay, and then um, this next poem that I'm going to read, actually all these poems about are about parenting, but are about motherhood. But um, the next poem that I'm going to read is called The Shopping Cart. Um, and this uh, poem was published in the Literary Journal by Carrie Chang, um, and it's called Lotus Magazine, or the, the Literary Journal is called Lotus Magazine. The poem is called The Shopping Cart. I celebrate the end of the school year by driving to Target, aimlessly pulling out a cart, asking the employee if the cart has been sanitized. I choose two bottles of Pinot Noir, raspberries, blackberries, try not to buy Driscoll's, but they're organic. I grab a dozen free range eggs, gluten-free bagels, sweet cherry tomatoes, and three boxes of mac and cheese. I look for a bathing suit. I don't like all the holes, all the ties, all the weird colors, all the different pieces. What happened to not having so many choices? I place two pairs of goggles, 
a mermaid's tail, 8D batteries for the camping fans since we'll be camping on our way to Virginia, teach the kids a thing or two about work, mosquito repellent with DEET, tweezers, Q-tips, rubbing alcohol in case of ticks, then more books and games, Uno, a wooden board of Chinese checkers, plants versus zombies, very important, a mermaid Barbie, a bunch of black hair rubber bands, and a stick of sunscreen. I should get out of here or else I'm going to continue to put more random knickknacks into this car cart and it will cost the entire stimulus check. As I'm waiting in line, looking at the hand sanitizers, the lip balms, the cute containers of Advil, beef sticks, adorable patterned cotton masks, Pringles, reusable bags, the small packs of Legos, Pokemon cards. I stare at all the things on the conveyor belt from the woman ahead of me and how she stacks all her things like it's a Jenga game. Jenga game. All of a sudden, I hear a song come on the radio and I realize this climax is also a resolution, whatever that means. And listening to this random song, I realize that this is not how I pictured my life and how my life will continue on this way with this feeling every time at checkout that there's so much left to do and how every time at checkout, there's always this feeling of loss. So many people have passed away in the year alone and how this affects us all, every single cell, every single bone, and how still I want Tic Tacs, Kit Kats, Three Musketeers, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, Dasani, Dad's Root Beer, Flaming Hot Cheetos, more reusable bags, gift cards to Starbucks for so-and-so, people and time, more people and more time. Yeah. Um, there's always, uh, I feel like whenever doing a Target run, there's always this feeling, maybe it's always just the music that's playing. It's always just like really 80s, really cheesy, and really just like makes you emotional. Um, Okay, so I'm going, the next poem that I'm going to read um, is called Organic Cat Cotton Tampons. And this was, this was also, it wasn't recently, but it was published um, in Barrow Street, um, a literary journal called Barrow Street. Okay, um, Organic Cotton Tampons. I remember the first time I had to use one it looked like a firm pillow on a string, and it was right after my eighth grade graduation. I was wearing a navy blue wool coat that day because I felt like I had the flu. Sharp pains in the belly grew, wide and wider still. I remember masking the pain, putting on post earrings, a shimmer of royal blue light on my ears, curling my bangs and bands of hair with a curling iron borrowed from my older sister. During the ceremony, I felt surges of the earth leave me, or perhaps it was more like a faucet turning quickly on, high, and then rapidly to off, on to off, and not being able to control it. Let it, my body added. Allow it, my body said. I remember the very first time I fell in love with the body of a man, all geometric, chiseled, so many lines bending, and I honestly began there. I knew just then why the body would want to grow sharp pains each month. It was as if the earth had entered my body and then left. It all made sense to me. It made sense to me to want to prepare to understand all the parts and folds, the tightened edges and those secrets and scars. Spending hours reading on his bed that smelled of his body, red cinnamon and black tea. And it's like that when you fall hard. It is absolutely like that. It is right to want to create something new and make the earth rise and come back to you. The wind changes direction and the light will too. <laughs> um, so I will read um, three more poems, if that's okay. Um, three more poems and then one um, last short poem. 
The next poem that I'm going to read is uh, called Rice Cooker. And it was uh, recently, uh, not recently, actually, um, a year ago, <clears throat> it was a finalist in the Mississippi Revi Review Poetry Prize. Um, and it's called Rice Cooker. The Rice Cooker. I'm cleaning the rice we need for dinner and rinsing rice starch water, pouring until the clean rice and water rest inside the metal of this rice cooker. I have, one, I have had one of these all of my life. <clears throat> I won't begin to tell you about the steam of the white rice or the prayers my mother would say before she doled a small scoop to each of us with her plastic white rice paddle or growing up working class. It doesn't matter. I am cleaning rice, but what I want from my life is to write poems all day and night. And I can't, I can't. Oh, genderless God of grace and gruel, give these grains of rice the power to give, to give to me and to give to others. Oh, genderless God of grace and gruel, let me, let you, let them be named this, poet of the field, poet of the land of other. Eat this and you become free. I have to remember that I am free. Wow, it really helps to have family members on the Zoom room clapping in the background. Um, okay, so um, the next poem that I'm gonna read is, um, it's a poem about grief and um, the poem is called Kimchi. And this poem, um, Kimchi was published in um, another Chicago magazine a while ago. Okay, Kimchi. Whenever we hear of another death in the family, my mother will often bury herself in the basement, immersing herself, sorry, in the basement, immersing her body into hours and hours of kimchi making, squatting with big earthen jars and large silver aluminum bowls. I remember using one of them to bathe my son when he was born. My mother layers the Napa cabbage covers in a blanket of light, green and white scallions, shutting the folds of the cabbage in rhizome of ginger, tucking in bulbs of allium sadavan, then flavoring in a disaccharide of glucose sugar and dried red pepper flakes. How often I see those red peppers the color of blood, sun drying on a blanket while walking around my father's village, a tobacco farm, and that tiny living space attached. We often wondered how so many family members could share a room together, sleeping on a floor out of necessity. What is healing for my mother is making this even saltier. She uses some form of fish or those tiny minuscule pink salted shrimp. When her brother died, I was 10. He was the uncle I would read about only in photographs. I remember watching her from the window of the basement door, the, for the forceful motion into layering the pepper onto the leaves of the Napa cabbage, a metal bowl singing from the movement and pressure, all the energy and force to move a body when it's grieving. Intentionally, she cut, diced, slivered, a weight growing, growing when folding something onto itself. Last year after my cousin's death, my mother and her sister-in-law made kimchi out of pounds and pounds of Joshian radish, burying themselves in the work, burying themselves and sustaining their family. Never once did they speak of the mental illness continually being buried in the bodies of family members. Never once did they speak of the healing properties of the spice, the pepper or the garlic. Instead, they just move along the way my mother moves along after hearing of, of each death, the way the bodies of the dead move along to their, form, their new form, the way that everything that is made by hand moves along, changes in form, changes in body, the way that this fermented spice, pepper, and garlic moves along, mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, 
moving through the body, moving without sound, moving, 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 the way the air moves while the house is soundless with sleep, the way the cold leaves and the wind move on the roof of the warm, warm house, the way thoughts and images move, becoming stronger after each passing, passing, passing. Okay, and then um, I'm gonna read two more really short poems. Um, the first poem uh, or the next poem is um, a poem that was published in Crosswinds Literary Journal and it's called Stars and You. Stars and You. Some scientists believe our star had a companion, may have been swept away by astronomical objects. Meanwhile, some other scientists now say, that the highest form of intellect is intuition. My intuition tells me that our bodies will come back in another form, perhaps as constellations in that river of stars. If so, so be it. Let our intuition, let our bodies, let the constellations and the stars, let all these things begin again so that I can come back and look for you. Okay. And then um, this is the last poem that I'm going to read. And the poem, uh, this poem was actually published in a journal called Literary Mama, and it's called Up North. Um, okay, Up North. If you go to the Porcupine Mountains, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and stay in one of the yurts in the park, be sure you bring bug repellent and bags, especially if you go right in June after school lets out for your summer break. Zipper your raincoat and put on, put on your hood. Bring plenty of water and almond cream. Coffee in the morning makes one grateful. No need for your gluten-free rice cooker. If you bring both your three and seven-year-old, be sure you remind them when they complain that this builds character. It's called hard work. Play in the creek shit and piss in a can. Thank you so much. <laughs> what a way to leave us, Viola. <laughs> but don't, yeah, don't mute yet. Yeah, we're going to talk now. <laughs> right. um, so let me invite, yeah, Pat and, um, and you, Viola, and me, I'll invite myself and let's, um, Let's talk about this this reading, this fantastic reading that you just gave to us. What what a gift! Um, so uh, so much vibrancy, so much to ask you about. Um, but <laughs> since it's a short interlude, uh, I'll start with a question, and then Pat, if you want to make some comments too. So I was just um, my these list poems are on my mind, um, and I just I love the way you do that list in the shopping cart poem. It just, I think it'll stay with me forever, really. So I was wondering, um, um, it's so original. I mean, a list, lists are, you know, there's so many ways to write lists. I was just wondering, um, I think you mentioned to me too about editing. I was wondering if the poem just came out that way or if you had to edit it quite a bit. Um, and if you would speak to that about, you know, that, writing that those lists and how that works for you yeah no thank you for that question um today this morning at um in, in writing group i went to writing group um and also i want to just really quickly just do a shout out to my uh to those that are here um that are part of that really amazing group because mm. they are um all amazing and inspiring as writers and also educators and people of the world. Um, but anyway, today during writing, writing group, um, one thing that we talked about, somebody asked, well, you know, like, tell me about the practice of writing. And I actually shared that so much of writing right now and so much of my life is like survival, like being a parent, being a teacher, everything feels like just like surviving. And, um, not that the standards are low, but that everything is about like surviving. And this has to do with lists in a second. Um, but 
in order for like the process of writing for me is that it, it feels like everything is like actually in tra- like th- when I'm in transit, like when I'm walking to school with my kids from taking the bus, when I'm on the bus, when I'm driving to and from school, when we're like leaving the door, everything feels like the poems are being generated um, while in transit. And so I, 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 I do feel like sometimes when it comes to lists, like um, writing to-do lists, there's like a certain sense of order that it provides in like, just like the chaos of just like surviving the everydayness of every day. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. So, so are you saying that it, that it does come to you pretty naturally that to write the list like that, or, um, I certainly get it that life is survival. And yeah, I can only imagine it. Yeah, maybe it 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 actually I, I do feel like maybe um you know like it, back to the poem about Target, it mm-hmm. I was actually um like it was actually the, the entire motion of like the target that we specifically go to, like taking the cart and like following that order and like going through the, you know, like the, the raspberries first and then going like it, it, it the, the, the list does actually come very, very natural. Mm-hmm. Um, That's how it seems. Yeah. But you know, your poems are so, uh, so fresh and beautifully, um, original and um you know i think we we think oh well you know they were easy to write but of course it takes so much effort and so much work to edit them and get them to be to look to to be that way right so um so i i really appreciate that about your writing a lot yeah pat do you want to do you want to jump in yeah I, I i a question that that i had um and it's it's from the poems you read tonight plus the the poems that were in um after hours that when you were the featured um the featured writer um you talk about oh genderless god and i i just love that phrase um and in fact when we met or we well, actually, when we met for the reading at the Washington Library, we, you and I talked about writing O poems, poems that begin with O or that have this this reference. So, uh, talk a little bit about O genderless God. How did where did that come from? And it's like, why don't we all use it all the time? You know, actually, Pat, I w- reading through your poems, and I'm I'm really excited to actually hear you read your poems and excited to talk about your poems. But um, something that I noticed about your poems is that one thing that I felt like was really, really beautiful, and you actually balance really well and manage to do really well, is like taking the um, the elevated, like the ecclesiastics, right, or like just like the idea of like biblical names like the elevated and then also mixing it in with just like um the 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 everyday like things like mcdonald's right and so like i i'm i'm always like i feel like also so much of poems are about just like living and being in the world and um i feel like also that's 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 like that's like it it's like it's very much about like balancing the elevated plus the everyday and maybe that's what odes and the the ode coup the ones that I, that i read which were just like a mix of the ode and the haiku but like maybe that's what it's that's that's the point too is like to take the everydayness but then also to um to like transform it in a way because sometimes life can be really hard, right? And so, um, and the purpose of maybe poetry is to take us from the hard parts and to transform it in a way that we find um, love and beauty and um, the things that give us meaning, I guess. I have no idea, yeah. But um, maybe that th- maybe that's it. Like the, it, it's like also like so much of what you do to take like the elevated and to also balance it in a way uh, to um, 
um, to, to the, uh, you know, like the everyday objects. And maybe it's like those everyday objects which ground us and the elevated takes us to this um, maybe deeper understanding and um, where we're also able to find meaning um, in the world. Yes, yes, that's what I mean to say. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what, yeah, what it what it makes me think about is um, is that how you want to have attention in in the work. So um, you know, so it's not just elevated, and it's not just down here. So it's pulling on each other. Is is that what you were you were you thinking of that as well? Or yeah, I um. You know, like I, it's, I today, um, I also am like, I, you know, like I know that for like, for example, Pat, for years, he was like a journalist and also Phyllis reading your poems, the full moon herald. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I, um, one of the things like with the full moon herald that I feel like also that I want to bring to light is also this idea of like both balancing what is public and what is private and like um so much of these poems in the full moon herald is like very much about like the public story but mm -hmm. taking the story because it can be really overwhelming to take the story and to also that there's like a private internal conversation that happens that allows us to process everything that's external mm -hmm. and hard and so maybe it's also like poetry is just about balancing um, the, the, the public, the private, um, mm -hmm. the grandiose and the everyday, um, the big and the small. Uh, beautiful. Well, let me just say, um, there's a couple of comments in the chat. Fred says, uh, the sense of surviving life does come through in your poems, that and the desire to break free from the restraints. I think that that really speaks, cuts right through, yeah? Would you agree? <laughs> the desire yeah. to break free from the restraints, do you think that's in there? Yeah, that's so interesting. Maybe, and maybe that's the, um, that's, and maybe that's also the, the line, maybe that's what the line that Patrick, Pat was referring to, like the with the genderless prayer. God, uh-huh. And the prayer to break free. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Muriel says not everyone shares their mind so generously. Um, and Garrett says it would be cool if when standing at the register uh, at Target, the cashier hands me back a receipt of a Viola poem. <laughs> 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 that would be really cool. <laughs> so let's, um, so if, are there any other thoughts? Um, that you're having Patrick or Pat, or should we, should we move on to your reading? Um, why don't we move on to my reading and then we can get back to. We can certainly all. talk it's, more. It's yeah, sort of like sure. we're on the beginning of talking big stuff and. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Like Ecclesiastes road and, um, and uh, Archangel Michael. Yeah. All right. Well, Viola, why don't you um, t uh, oh. introduce Pat and um and then and then we'll we'll be uh honored and blessed to hear pat read okay yeah let me introduce pat um patrick t reardon writes poetry that is woven out of his four decades as a chicago tribune newspaper reporter his lifelong wrestling with religious doubt and faith his experience as the oldest of 14 children 14 children of Irish Catholic parents and his deep knowledge and love of cities. A three-time Pushcart Prize nominee, he has written the history book, The Loop, The L Tracks that shaped and saved Chicago 2020 and six poetry collections, including Salt of the Earth, Doubts and Faith and Puddin, the autobiography of a baby a memoir that describes the first year of an infant in the infant's voice. Okay, father and son, brother, journalist, husband, and friend. I'm grateful that I can call Patrick T. Reardon a friend. So grateful. And here is Patrick Reardon. Thank you, Viola. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Well, um, uh, Viola mentioned the angel Michael, and Phyllis mentioned the angel Michael. So I've got to start with the angel Michael. Uh, uh, and uh, there's there's a number of angels that appear in these poems that I'm reading tonight um, or today, um, but uh, they're not actually the angels that you think of, except they are, they aren't. Anyway, you'll you'll see, you'll see pretty quickly. So the, the first poem is called uh, The Angel Michael. The Angel Michael stopped Friday morning at the McDonald's on Western, just north of Pratt, and sat hunched over the corner table eating his egg McMuffin and blazing with the glory of the celestial throne and was of such incandescence that local TV weather forecasters announced it in ripe bulletins with maps as if a, a small other sun had landed next to the emptied and forlorn Harley Davidson sales room and floating technicians up on the shuttle looked down from space to awe the bright spot on the daylight continent and the two aisle sides in the House and Senate adjourned to the Western steps to look out past Ohio and Indiana to the Southern end of Lake Michigan where mere Chicago flared like the earth's great jewel. Love is wide. And he was reading a book of poetry in a language no longer spoken and pondering his lacks and warts and astral sins, knowing the need of penance and pushing her foldable steel shopping cart, the small woman compact in her oldness saw his tears and offered him a Kleenex from the box she carried in her weathered leather purse and put, put a fierce and gentle caress on his virgin hand for a moment and smoothed the feathers of his left wing as if he were a troubled dog or a child shocked by a tumble and the surface of the earth opened and all the dead of all time rose like a cacophonous choir of random voices, random notes blending in beauty and then tenderly, slowly, the rapturous radiance faded and the wings vanished and the accountant at the table was asleep arms cradling head, naive body protecting his closed laptop, silently a hum, a twitch, softly snoring, an austere dream of First Communion. As, as uh, Phyllis and, and, uh, and Viola have said, I, I bring the Bible Bible words, Bible names into um, into poems, and uh, uh, several of my books have dealt with the with the suicide of my brother David, who was um, uh, sixty four um, when he took his life. This was seven years ago, um, and so he appears in a lot of my uh, a lot of my poems, um, either directly or or indirectly. Uh, here's one poem called Hitchhiking Ecclesiastes. I saw David hitching on, out on Ecclesiastes Road four years after the gun. He was on the shoulder of the northbound lanes. I was heading south. His blonde hair and back below the New York Giants cap was black with thick, dry blood. He had a large sign saying, going to hell. He wasn't laughing. He would have waved to me if he had seen me, I'm, I'm sure, or maybe yelled and thrown a, the sign at me, brotherly love. Coming a year later, he was my crib twin, screaming while I laid low. The camera rises to a wide shot of the forest sunset, foregrounding David and me. My black car moves smoothly down, 
south down the ribbon road, he stands alone in the dust. The credits roll, his is a bit part, mine is played by a stunt double. One of the things that David's suicide led me to do was to go back into looking very closely at my, my childhood, um, at his childhood too, our, our, our shared childhood. Um, but uh, particularly uh, in the year that before he was born, the year that I was a baby. Um, and this, what I came up with was a, a book of 101 pages uh, each page is a different installment of the baby talking about the baby's life from the baby's point of view. Um, and it ends in the final final uh, 101st uh, installment, uh, which is with the birth of David. So the first three, I'm going to read the first three. They're all very short. One. January 3, 1950. She is gone. I wish I knew why she goes. She was not glad I shit. She made that face. Her hands were rough as she changed me. She tied the strap more tight on me and put the milk thing through my lips with force. I feel the smooth skin of the thing that holds the milk. It is slick. The tips of my hands stretch out. They hurt and feel good. I want to cry. The milk wants to get in my mouth. The brown tip feels wrong. I won't suck. I have no way to cry. I scrunch my eyes. I send lines through me. There are lines of light in me. There are lines of fire. I move my legs. I jerk them. I want her to come back. I do not want her to come back. Two, January 6, 1950. He is here. He keeps his space. He looks to her. He has that frown. He has that line to his mouth. He does not like to look at me. His hands are large. They move me with ease. He smiles when she is here. He makes jokes. He flies me through the air. The breeze is cold on my skin. I pee. They laugh. Three, January 10, 1950. Aunt's eyes smile, her voice smiles, her eyes go wide with joy. The skin of her face is soft on the skin of my face. I feel her and lean all of me on her. She hugs me on her. The weight of her arms feels good, like I am part of her. The length of her on the length of me feels good. I look at her eyes. They look at me. A line runs from her eyes through mine to deepen me. She calls me Puddin. So as I say, there are um, another uh, eight, 98 uh, installments like that in the book. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is a long one. And again, uh, it's angels, but you'll have to make up your mind of who the angels are. It's called Angels Are Out Tonight. Tonight, the typewriter keys slam rhythm to ease coarse electricity under the skin. The sister of the sacred heart pleads alms and sweats under her habit as angels stride thickly east and west on her sidewalk. Angels fly com complex patterns over the drunk anesthesiologist and the beautiful child. Angels are out tonight. The boy rocks his body right and left to sleep as angels whisper green forest in his ear 
without mentioning the future gun, a charity. Angels are out tonight as the fox scouts among the headstones, as the sigh ends in stillness, as brother pain is traded for sister death. Tonight, angels are on the wind, like a tune up the sidewalk, like the white paint piers of the elevated, like the ocean of police marching State Street, Newman's jolly coppers, the white glove parade. Down the court run fast break angels, in the chemistry movement, actions and reactions without finish or start. Angels are out tonight lining the beige nursing home walls and planless fireflies starscape the orphan shelter lawn. Angels with assumed names mingle the Cubs crowd tonight after a loss and smoke Winston's outside the gay bar and close up shop, lowering the commercial grade roll down stainless steel security door with a thud. Tonight, as the handgun rusts, angels are out, as ballerinas, as ballerinas pirouette the Bible verse along the red brick wall, as the sacristan eats his filet -o fish as the lawyer in her sweat stands on the suburban balcony, overlooking an industrial park and tries to remember the name of the kindergarten boy who vomited. Angels are out tonight. Angels embrace sorrow tonight, finding storm within storm. They crowd tables in the Taylor Street Trattoria, drinking water and wine and breaking bread before the elbow macaroni arrives, parsley, the last supper of the night. Angels run a marathon tonight along Lakeshore Drive. Wearing orange vests, they dig a ditch with loud machines. They sing gospel songs and blues hymns and country and Western anthems and ubi caritas. In the sanctuary, a lieutenant kneels. Angels echo in the high church space along the stained glass annunciation. My soul magnifies, she said. Angels are out tonight. As I walk along Clark Street through the cold night to apologize, angels hide in the space behind the streetlights, and my sister balances the weight of all that has come and all that will happen, and my mother's ashes are harmless, and the aunt who saved my life is willowy and curly blonde still in the backyard with the baby that I was. Latter-day angels tonight are out and bi-coastal angels and special needs angels and glass half full angels, Latin rite angels, strip club angels, handyman angels, service dog angels, the heavenly host in Mufti. Tonight, the woman wearing eight layers of pants and six shirts asleep in the tent on the Broadway sidewalk amid metal restaurant tables and chairs is with angels, swinging like the little girl she once was, rising up, swooping back, legs building height, and at the top of her high, high arc, she lets go and she flies up and out into the light, the biblical furnace where all pain is burned off like dross, revealing pure. At the alderman's office, the precinct captain takes a call and dispatches a crew of angels to fill the potholes on the short street outside the ward. Through inattention or devotion or commotion or obligation or corruption or inspiration or sedation or kindness. Angels are out tonight. The Pope works as a bouncer. The Boston Celtic drives a hack. A poem is written on the alley wall of a downtown hotel in pencil on sooty bricks, never to be read. And angels stir the coffee in every cup on every table in the hotel's rooftop restaurant. And two miles away at the homeless refuge and in the mayor's kitchen, and after the banker has said the rosary and untouched between lovers bending toward each other and whispering, unknowing, the secret of breathing. Angels are out tonight. Michael and Gabriel, Uriel and Raphael, the thrones and dominations, the cherubim and seraphim. Tonight, Amble the glittered Andersonville pavement 
and climb the shadowed Englewood apartment stairs and sit at the edge of the dark Glenview yard where a man who knows he is dying barbecues for the ones inside each talk and tick mundane and solemn. Tonight, angels sleep on the red line from Howard to 95th and back and back and back. Tonight, tri-state tollway motorists barrel through the I-pass lanes, avoiding the toll booth angels chanting the daily office. Tonight, angels fall asleep in the ice white television light. Angels fight on the carpet until mom takes the plastic baby away from them. Angels in the hotel room can't take their clothes off fast enough. Angels are out tonight running around the university track, each step an eternity, each exhalation another big bang. In the sovereign tap, angels caress their Miller lights and watch Fred Astaire in the royal wedding in between used car commercials. Angels tonight await the second coming. Know they need, know they want, know they have no idea. Feel the high wearing off. Leave a backpack on the platform. Take an extra base. Twitch, stalk, run at the nose, run on empty, run to danger. In the silence above the alleys, angels are out tonight as urgent rats worshipped in India revered in Rome and China and old Japan, jitter from hole to hole, the vaulted circuit. Tonight, early drafts are put through the shredder for no reason but delight at spaghetti paper, a dry meal of textured wonder and portent, a gluten-free repast and echo of the halls of heaven. Wow. <laughs> Just and one last poem. Um, okay. <laughs> um, wow. Can, can I can I do one more poem? Yeah, time for one more. Yeah. I just I had to say know. something. Pardon? <laughs> I had to say something. That oh. was bravo. Okay. <laughs> well, that was it's a long poem, that's for sure. Wow. Um I, I don't normally write about what's going on in 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 the war in our country, in the world, but uh, in, uh, in, in, I'm not using comedy directly on what's going on, and this thing doesn't actually. Yeah, I guess it does, but you'll. It's called "In Those Days." In those days, excuse me. <laughs> Let me get a sip. In those days. In those days, the self-afflicted were loud with a, like a rat caught in the dark pipe. In those days, the dead buried the dead. In those days, the seamless garment was torn from top to bottom like the temple veil, like the broken knees of the thieves. In those mass days, in those shrill days, I threw my cloak over innocent shoulders. I walked along streets gargoyled by fear. I saw anger eaten with relish and vomited with shouts of joy. Lord have mercy. In those days, memory was a gap. Rapine pioneers claimed continents. Certainty was an abyss. I was body and bread, lamb of God. In those purple days, in days lost to haze, in days lost to true north, in those days, the wasteland was a field to seed, the warp land, a soil of nurturance along the edges, the center. In those days, the faithful denied doubts and the sick denied their sickness. In those days, the lady of peace hid in a cave. I was served a stew of white bones. I walked the wide back highway from Sodom careful not to look back. As swift black hummers thundered past on their way to the Dead Sea. In those days, the newborn dawn was ignored in the air conditioned caves with a cyclops rock lodged to block entrance. 
a type of vulture stood high in the halls of legislators as the judges robed an arrow. Holy, holy, holy. In those days, I walked the path of birds. I was one with the communion of sparrows, drab and without significance. In those days, alarms were embraced. No feet were washed. Dust settled on the leaves like a sledgehammer. In those days, no one heard the sacred hobos. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Pat. Let's take a minute for some applause. And um, let's let's talk. I mean, wow, <laughs> where do we start? <laughs> that was great, Patrick. <laughs> That's what Phil says. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, gosh, well, I have a question. Now. Is it okay if I ask a question? Yeah, please do. <laughs> so, so, Pat, um, those last two poems were really, I feel like they were really, really, really powerful. Um, and, you know, like, I know that you write a lot about the city and you get energy from the city. But there, I, I feel like one of the things that you did in both those poems that like it, it also felt like it was like re like energizing every single time you said it. It was almost like an incantation or like a like the use of re repeating yourself, right? Like mm -hmm. over and over again. So I guess like my question was when you wrote that, was it just that? that saying whether it was like in those days or even angels are out tonight was that what was generating the rest of the poem when you were writing it and i'm curious to know how it felt when you were reading it as well like both those poems well first of all um there's <clears throat> i i do that with a lot of poems where i'll have a repetitive word or phrase and just uh, just roll with it and and it does start with the phrase um, the, the there's the 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 chapbook I have is called the the um, the lost tribes, and that is that that riffs off the concept of lost tribes um, uh, that I found the lost tribes or whatever. And there's it's just repeating and repeating and repeating various ways throughout the whole chapbook. Um, and that started. I remember um, I was at church uh, during mass and there was some mention of lost tribes and I wrote it down on a, on, on a scrap mm -hmm. of paper at, as something that I could play with. And when I got home, I started, I started doing it. Your question about how it felt to read, um, it really stirs me to read both of those, but particularly the angels one, you know, it's, um, it, it, it uh, uh, there, there's just there's a, there's just a rhythm and uh, and a uh, a uh, um, and and incantation. I think incantation is 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 something that could be uh, applied to a lot of the, the poems that I write. There's just a, a kind of it's almost Old Testament uh, sort of prophet rhythm or something going on there. I'm, I'm I I try not to think too closely about it just let it happen but it does um it does uh uh, uh somebody just put a, a thing in the chat about that it's like the catholic litany and that's exactly true the litany of if you've ever heard the a litany in a catholic church it's just pray for us pray for us pray for us and it's this rep repetitive thing um and uh uh and so it, it is i think the incantation thing is is really a, a, an interesting uh word for it it's kind of like a personal, your own personal way of praying, right? Um, but it's it's such a twist on whatever it is that, you know, that traditionally is happening. Um, and I, I, I wanted to know, um, so you said something about the different angels. You said, um, depending on, how did you say it? Uh, depending on what the angels, what kind of angels were... Um, you were writing about, I just wanted to know more about that. So could you say more about that? Like the different angels that were showing up in well, that poem and what that meant I, to you? I, I'm not, I, 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 um, I'm not sure because 
because I've, I've, I've uh, I, I shared this with my writing group at one point, and and they were saying, well, wait, wait, uh, are there angels there, or are we angels, or you know? And it's like I, I, I don't want to. In some ways, it's, um, in some ways, it's, it's, uh, it's probably people acting like angels. In some cases, it's, it's some stuff going on that's like angels it's, and i think the deeper thing is that we're all in the middle of this a lot of good stuff a lot of the, that you can look at life at all the negative all the bad stuff or you can look and recognize that there's all this this we're all kind of um uh we're all we're all part of of the. There's another poem I've got called Communion of Saints, which is a, a term from the Catholic faith that you know all the people of uh, are are part of the Communion of Saints, and um, and again in that case, saints are often thought of as these holy holy rollers who are canonized, but but in fact every every person is is part of this communion, at least as as I see it. So the angels are sort of like the communion of saints, but I, um, I, I, uh, I, I, there is no key to it in the sense of oh, if you know this, then it all fits together. I, mm -hmm. so I, I like the ambiguity of it. I think the ambiguity is part of what what the whole thing is that it's that it is amb ambiguous. You know, Try, living is amb ambiguous. Did did you uh, when you wrote when you wrote those poems or even the the lost tri the um, especially the archangel one or not the archangel sorry the angels the angels poem that you read uh, the longer poem yeah. did you write it all in one sitting oh no 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 it it was it it it's like a uh, it gets it's like a um, I picture uh, like a uh, Rauschenberg is is that the guy who who made uh, mm -hmm. these 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 collages you know with Nixon's face and you know all these different things he just kind of throw them all in and so they're kind of collages and and they they get they 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 get layered over a period of time usually a couple of weeks or so um, and they'll you know so I'll be adding this adding that taking this out you know editing that putting things moving things around um and at some point it's just oh all right i'm done um and uh but but it is it it this it, and it's it's really fun when you get started on this you know if, if i get started i've got like a page of 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 uh of the text um then Oh, I'm, uh, I then I get I, I get some more and I throw them in and I see how they fit and then I get some more and so it's kind of growing, it's sort of like a baby growing, in the womb and then suddenly the, the baby's full ready to be born, if that makes any sense. It's uh, I imagine too that it's it's almost like a when you're reading it, Pat, when you are reading the longer poems. Tell me if I'm wrong. But I imagine it's almost like running a marathon too. Like you have to also mentally prepare. Like I'm, I'm going to do this really. It, it's like a physical. It's like really like a physical act of reading it, right? And so oh, like, and so it's almost like okay, let me pay, let me pace myself. Let me let me um, let me be mentally ready. And then I'm sure after reading it, it's almost like wow, I need like a I need a nap. <laughs> You know, there there is that thing of like the actor, you know, coming off stage or the 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 rock star coming off stage, and it's like, well, you know, that was that just felt so good to do, you know, and now now I have to be a real person again. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'd like to invite. Is there anybody in our audience who wants to um, say something or ask a question? Um, I'd I'd love to invite. Ah, Lucy, yeah. Let me um Hi. Oh, uh, welcome. It's great to be here. Um so I, I'm very interested in uh the kind of poetry that both of you write. Um and Patrick, this is actually a question for you. I was interested, so both Viola and Pat Patrick seem to use lists. Um 
you know, the, those last two poems um, by you, Patrick, um, feature lists. And yet those lists seem very different to me. Um, there is, I feel that in Viola lists, um, there seems to be more interruption into revelation, like the mundane kind of revelation that happens in the midst of it. Um, versus in your list, uh, Pat, I, I, I've, there's a kind of building um, up until the very end, um, even though they feature uh, incongruous details. I also noticed a kind of, um, I was thinking about um, magical realism. There's something that reminded me of that. So I was wondering about um, both of your influences in your poetry. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Thank you for the question. Viola, why don't you start? Um, before, yeah, no, I, I would love to. But first of all, I also want to add Lucy. Lucy and I are in poetry. Uh, ah. And Lucy is also a really amazing poet. Really oh, amazing. good to meet you, Lucy. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Viola. That's very generous. So um, back to your question, Lucy, about um, the lists, right? So um, the lists, and then also, um, sorry, and then, so one of the things when Lucy mentioned what Lucy brought up, I do feel like there is like always an element of um, like revelation um, and essentially um, to, to get to not is trying to teach a lesson or to teach um to teach but i do feel like um it is always an opportunity whenever writing a poem or also reading a poem that it's always an opportunity to actually um to get to a, a space where there is re revolution resolute resolu uh, not resolution um just like revelation re revelation thank you phyllis yes <laughs> revelation okay. So like um, the idea of like, whether it is, um, and, and, and not so much also like revelation in that, like, you know, like the uh, omni, you know, present uh, omniscient voice, I'm going to teach, you know, this, but more like um, relation to get to a point uh, essentially of connecting with others and so I think that that's like the very act of writing poems and also writing um, and also reading poems, because in the end, when reading a poem, there is like a sense of that there is like not so much a relationship, but that when reading a poem or reading somebody who I um, am inspired by or have heard their poems are wonderful, there is like this um it's it's a space of connection and it's really a space of like um understanding um through uh feeling and through emotion i don't know if that makes any sense um but i i, I do feel like even in the mundane act of like making a list and writing a poem that seems like okay this is a list adding the refrigerator and the meatballs and the meat sticks and the hello kitty dolls and the pokemon cards that in the end all this stuff this like addition and this um, that when you you know when like um, unearthing all this stuff that in the end there is light and that there is like just like a a small blip of um, of something that is revealed and something that is also revealed that is very human if that makes any sense well you, yeah I mean when you make that turn. So the shopping cart's the one I keep thinking about. I mean, I I really love all of the poems that you read and the ones that I've other ones that I've read too. That one, I think that um it it's so it, it's just so memorable because it's so familiar. That's part of it, you know. Um and so when you make the turn from, you know, those things in the cart aren't gonna really bring anybody back to life. They're not gonna really fix what's broken and what's wrong. It just, uh, it just stands out and it's so moving because um, we're all relating to that. I mean, especially during the pandemic, but um, so that's how I would, how I would look at that. 
Well, uh, to 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 um, to follow on Viola's comment, um, I think every piece of everything is is filled with wonder in it. In a, if you look at it the right way, if you're picking up a, a tampon box, you know, it's wonderful it, it, if you look at it the right way. And and Viola showed us that you can you can take that and turn it into a poem. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's the one thing about the, the gritty individual details of life that we have to we can't look at really closely most of the time just because it's it, it, it we don't have we, we have to get through life, but um, but when you look at it, there's something really um, wonderful about each thing, each person, each whatever. And then to to, to uh, respond to Lucy's question about uh, what my influences were, and especially with the list, I, I, I'm realizing, well, the list are the but my big uh, influences are like Ginsburg's Howl, which is. This long, repetitive thing of just you know uh, repetitive uh, phrasing in in uh, in this this format, or the uh, the the prophets and the the psalms of the Old Testament. This this repetitive thing. I, I learned. I I realized recently that I first learned poetry by going to church and hearing the the psalms. Um, so these sorts of uh those sorts of things uh really are ingrained in me um and that uh that has uh that that's why these uh I, i'm trying uh, i'm trying to uh, follow the lead of, of ginsburg with with howell um or follow the lead of jeremiah or or isaiah um just to get some to mm. to to fit stuff in and into a, a rhythm, into into a uh, or the or the Catholic Church litany, as somebody mentioned. So let me invite Mary Marsha. You had a comment. <laughs> well, I mean, they already be passed, but I wanted to say how much the with the revelation comment is so wonderful, and the and magical realism, the idea of taking them in June and how it, the poem lifts it sort of unearthed it. And um, in my note on the chat, I mentioned with Patrick, I know, you know, I was so enthralled and with the repetition, I not, sometimes don't remember specific lines or phrases, but one that struck me was, I think that it went something like every, um, the angel stirs every cup of coffee I drink, something yeah. like that, which is so, regular and yet not it's uplifted and with i'm particularly charmed by of course the shopping cart but the, and forgive me i don't remember this the title the kimchi the making mm -hmm. of the kimchi and the description of the jars that she bathed the baby in the the jars her yeah. son and then also the kind of the physical work of making the kimchi her the mother or the thing, you know, and there's a description of that that re brought out so much to me. That's what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. I, well, I really you. appreciated all that. And one quick question for Viola is that you have so many awards and things that you talk and, and shared that you got published. In making a book, is that how most of your work and slid in some others? Or did you make the book just based on things that you wanted the book to be, as in you had an idea book. Does that make sense? Mary, Marcy, can, Marcy, can you, Mary Marcia, can, would you mind repeating the question one more time? Okay, the question is about your book. When you made your book, was it formally the, the things that got published that stirred the book, or did you have uh, the idea, um, the theme already pre-imagined? Thank you. Um, thank you. So your question was when I made the book, the I'm, I'm assuming the first book that was published. Yeah. Um, were, were, were there themes or, or did I just take every single poem that was published and put it into a book form? Mm -hmm. Um, no. So I, th um, the book that, um, 
the man, the the very first book, and there was only about sixty copies that were made for for this first book, Lightning After the Echo. The second book, it's not really a book; it's a a manuscript. Um, but the the first book, it was actually just a collection of poems that were written, and pretty much those poems were not published. Okay. Um, yeah, pretty much okay. they weren't published. But they were pretty. They're 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 very. I I feel like that also they're very similar in that it's very much grounded in the domestic sphere of every day, and all those it's it all those things of the world like Pokemon cards and backpacks and lunch boxes and the, the Jenga and, <laughs> and the stacking and, the, and things like that. yeah and, the and also the, the teacher and the mother come out so much in, in what you read. So thank you. That's uh, that's all I have to say right now. Yeah, no, thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary Marcia. So, um, yeah, Wendy, let's bring you in. Oh, Wendy, where'd you go? Um, Patrick, I, I um, what what I want to say about angels are out tonight. Uh, I want um, you achieved this for me, uh, involving me in an experience of um, recognizing this, uh, this wonderful freedom where uh, our own categories of things limited by a year, what happened in the past, these, all these walls fall down so that what happened in the past is present with the angels recognizing uh, past and present um, they, they are all they are all suffused with this with this meaning um, he, uh, everywhere, so that there is this sense in which the the kind of limitations that maybe our religion put on angels, you know, where they show up in their classification and and, and where where to find them and so on, is is uh, is completely overturned with an with an insight of their involvement in a very uh, a vibrant way with ourselves and that past and present are all present. So, and, and, and finally, I, I thought there was, there's a, a statement inside that about the affirmation of life itself as holy and that involves the angels. Um, and so I, I, I have a, I did have a little, a little question to you about about when you were fashioning the the insights that you had, um, did when you did that, were were you conscious then? Or I suppose you were uh, of of uh, reflecting on angels that have been involved in the past, and and, and juxtaposing them with the, with a very prosaic realities that we would see as the present. You know, I mean, it's just a beautiful yeah. poem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, Wendy is a theology, a re retired theology professor at Loyola University. Biblical. Good Biblical. Of mine. Um, New Testament. New Testament. New Testament. Testament. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, to, to, to go to your question, I'm not really thinking of things like that. I'm thinking of, it's because I covered Chicago for 32 years as a Tribune reporter, I was I, I really kind of know it like by by sidewalk to sidewalk, you know. It, I, I once drove with a photographer from the south end of Chicago all the way to the north end through the alleys for a story we were doing. So it it, it just was um so so that's there. And then I've got this whole grounding with the the old testament and the new testament, and then I'm just kind of I'm seeing how they talk to each other, and and not only that, but it's 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 this sense. I think I'm uh, there. There is there is a thing of that there. There is that that it that, that like everything is good if if that everything fits together in a way that we don't understand it, we don't see it, and and so I'm trying to I'm trying to say what I can't see. What none of us can see, so that I'm that that's as good, as good as I can get. That's great, thank you, Patrick. So, let me bring Perry on. 
Terry Longo. Um, hi, everybody, and Phyllis, wonderful to see you again. Mm -hmm. um, Lois, Phyllis and I go way back. When you were reading, I, um, Patrick, I, I messaged Phyllis and said, do you remember a poem I wrote that we then built on each other's poems? And the first line of the poem that I wrote was, maybe angels are mistakes corrected. <laughs> and so I really enjoyed your enlivening that. I, mean, I wrote that, we wrote this exchange back in 2008. I went into my microscope. What's amazing is I remembered the title. So <laughs> back that long ago. And I am um, I was raised a Catholic, uh, 16 years of Catholic schools. And in my family, my mother always called me her angel. And an angel meant somebody who was really good and always pleased everybody. When I got to be a, a teenager, she called me a little devil because an angel was the, the word angel as as a as an adult came to me to mean, uh, which I heard in your poem, both of your poems in a different way, even though Viola, you didn't use the word angel. But the ordinary things are just as much as an angel as the ethereal being. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's an acknowledgement. And I think whoever just spoke said it be beautifully that um, we are all transcendent beings and we don't realize it until we start thinking about it. And I remember those old litanies and, and my siblings and I, we used to joke about it. We'd come home from mass or friday service or whatever and we go blah, 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 pray for us blah, 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 pray, pray for us blah, 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 blah. and then then we would make up words oh my uh, uh the rice and the meatballs pray for us oh the burnt blah 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 pray for us <laughs> so we would use all this stuff and my parents would have a fit um <laughs> so in a way the ordinary Viola, in your poem, these these mundane objects are themselves kind of like angels. And you talked about the fireflies and the, you know, and the camping and you know, <laughs> you we're going camping and the the shit and the pee. You know, these are these are good things. This is holy. I mean, so I really, really, all that is to say, I really enjoyed tremendously both of your readings from a very personal and impersonal. Background, uh, just wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Perry. Thank you. So, um, so there's a few more comments in the chat that I wanted to read. Um, Barbara says, "This is a mighty, impressive flock of poets and sacred souls here. You two are a big and profound draw. I hope you can take that in." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then Mary Marsha says, angels are out are out tonight made me think of the magic of fireflies. Yeah. And that camping, that camping poem, that last line, it'll just never leave you, right? You, that's, you're going to remember that forever. It's like, I will anyway. Ha, yeah. I just wonder how, what the genius, how did you get to that? I don't know if you had that in your mind or it just flew in or, <laughs> Wow. Do you want to say say something about that? No, but I I, I just I wanted to say something that um that Pat Patrick that Pat just mentioned and he just said um what did he just say that I felt like was really really you know like trying to say or trying to write and say what you can't really say like trying to writing essentially tree mm -hmm. essentially is writing what is um that you can't say and that it's unspeakable. And so even though, for example, and that's perhaps maybe why the list form works, because essentially it's like just trying to get something on the page, um, trying to get words onto the page to get to that part of unearthing and revelation. Um, but I really like that, that like that writing is what is, is what is unspeakable. That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. 
So let's think about, let's see if anybody else has a comment. Your comments are brilliant. Thank you all so much. Does anyone else have anything that they'd like to add? And um, and if not, oh, some uh, Phil says the so many utterances from church growing up that stick in our heads, which I agree. There's um, I really agree with that. The childhood things that'd be really it's fun to think about writing about that, like the things you heard that stuck in your head. Um, that you don't think about as much as, as an adult, but then you remember them. Um, so, so I think, um, huh? Well, there's one more question here, and then we'll, and then I think we're going to go to some closing. Um, so the question is, what do you remember best about Chicago? <laughs> and that was for. Well, that was for well, Pat, I, I'm still in Chicago, so I felt <laughs> like I left. You know, yeah. Uh, I guess he thought you left, right? But there, you're yeah, both I, still I was in born Chicago, here and uh, and I've lived my whole, whole life here. Uh, and what I, you know, I I can't say I can't say what I like best. Uh, it's sort of like trying to choose which of your children you like best. You know, mm. I mean, a city is just it's it's itself. It is. The bad things are as as important as, as part of it as the good things. Me, not meaning the bad things aren't bad, but they're bad. Mm -hmm. But they're they're part of the yeah. What it's it's like uh, anyway. Just if that's that's the city is so so diverse and so uh, rich. It's this tremendous um, weaving of of lives together. Well, it's obvious that you both love love be living there. And I noticed that 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 the beauty of home and place that um, is is quite profound. You know, when you grow when you are born and grow up in the same place, um, I certainly didn't have that experience of staying in one place. So I think there's really something to be said for that. Um, so let let me just um, let you know. I don't know if we actually talked about. <laughs> closing poems. Did I, did I mention that to either one of you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, I you did. did. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good for me. So, <laughs> so let's do that. Let's, um, let's have you each read. Um, and um, Pat, why don't you read first and Viola can, can take us, take us out. All right. I had a, a, a different poem um, set aside to read, but uh, because we mentioned fireflies, um, I'm going to read a poem at the beginning of, it's the first poem in my book, Darkness on the Face of the Deep. Um, and uh, and it has fireflies in it, but they don't do too well at the beginning. But anyway, all right, it's called Pa. Drive Chronicles Avenue straight out of downtown for three miles to the railroad bridge, empty as a Roman rune. Turn right toward the spray paint chaos of the Grass Lake rocks. Right again onto Esther Road to 135. And there's tight wound Pa sitting on the dusk porch while nervous fireflies, trespassers, skitter knowing nothing else around the maypole of his chair. From time to time, he slaps out with a grime 1940s gas station swatter. And when he connects, steps daintily on the stunned creature with the sole of his right boot, drags that soul toward him along the porch wood, leaving godlike quick drying sparkle. We keep out of his way. Stolid Ma encases herself in jobs to be done as if rest is a gap in breathing. Her grave is out on 12th Street, just east of Mystic Boulevard, in the plot she shares with Pa as she shared their bed of relief. Pa died slowly, silently, from a wasting, pale as smoke fearful even more of death than of life, with no caressing God to provide welcome, just a blank white he glimpse, glimpse here and there, now and then, and shudder 
lock up inward, no escape. Garden of Eden Groceries, the family firm, still opens and closes each day, weekends included, Christmas accepted. Pa ran a tight ship, each an assigned post, sister, brother, niece, nephew, in-law, cousin, crowd of vague similar names, Jane, Joan, June, Jean, Gary, Larry, Jerry, Joe, everyone's head turned. Ma wanted me out of there, oldest and a girl, Pa had an eye. I was the one sent out from the store each day to travel up and down Babylon City, buying what we needed, arranging de deliveries to Holy Gallery Hospital, the Tyre County Department of Corrections, and City Hall, where Pa knew a guy in the sewer department who gave a filing job to Leah, a year younger than me, Ma's idea again which Pa used for inside information about street work, bids, and free bricks, until after Pa and Ma were dead and gone, she quit and took the same job for a lawyer across the street on the sixth floor of Maccabees Tower, and hated it just as much until one noon, while I was sitting on the bank of the Babylon River seven blocks away, she took herself up to the roof and jumped her freedom flight of wonder-filled license to the downtown pavement in front of three teenagers from West Suburban El Dorado. Lots of good at dinner, said Father George, the youngest of the boys, a John Paul II priest, quickly hushed by the sisters who knew proper etiquette. No pedophile he, too empty for lust. I slapped him. Now. Evenings, if you drive to Esther Road, you'll find me on the dusk porch in Pa's old chair. I leave the lightning bugs alone. Leah whispers in my ear, but I can't burn the house down. Where would I live? It is the last Sunday in ordinary time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Pat. And now, um, Viola. Um, okay, so I'm going to really quickly say, a, a, um, is it a quote or a quotation by the 24th Poet Laureate of the US? So before I read the next poem, um, the 24th Poet Laureate of the US is actually Ada Limon. And mm -hmm. she also recently was named the Woman of the Year in um, Time Magazine. And she wrote, this is, um, she wrote this on social media about National Poetry Month, and I love uh, April and National Poetry Month, but she wrote, don't forget that National Poetry Month only really means you should try to nap more and eat snacks and drink water and read poems and cry and laugh and look at trees. And that's Ada Limone. Oh. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna read this last poem um, or this poem that I recently wrote and it's not published. It's, um, it was workshop this morning, um, but my husband and I are both teachers and we actually a lot of times talk about education and school. And we were actually talking about an education model instead of it being a hierarchy, that it was more like a circle or a circumference of a circle. So like, for example, that the edu that education where there is no hierarchy, where the teachers, the support staff, the administrators all take part in the leading, the teaching, the supporting, and the administrationing, administ admin the administration part. Um, so this poem is called School. School. This is not that little place down the street from your house with a small one-room classroom of seven, where everyone gives you individual care and attention. This is called you fend for yourself. Finding work means finding purpose, which means you build your life accordingly. It has doors, this place. Some may, some may say it opens to a bully who teaches you to fight like bloody hell. Some may say it opens to a little theater 
where singing means to give generously, where you learn about rivers, kingfishers, the body you know as home, the inequity of the city, equivalence in trust, the geometry in art and thought, and the story you build and build and build, where you learn that each morning casts light in our very days, where you learn that one day we will appear an older version of a body of a body, and all that walking and all those little doors have become the learning you've set to do. All things physical have become metaphors, have become what you say you see. Today, an ant walks on the face of this screen, working so hard to climb this angle. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank everybody for being here and all of your amazing questions and participation. Um, it's been just absolutely wonderful. Um, and um, uh, and I just wanna, I, I wanna say that uh, next time we're gonna have Doug Ramspeck and George Looney it should also be a wonderful, a wonderful um, evening. And uh, it, everyone is just so unique and so wonderful. So thank you so much to Pat and Viola for making this a really, really special reading. And we'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm.